So without further ado, let's welcome Dr. Rukmini Banerjee, please. Uh, good afternoon, friends. <clears throat> it's a great pleasure to be here. I believe I have it from good sources that this is the best university in Hong Kong, maybe the best university in Asia, and who knows, maybe the best university in the world. <laughs> um, you know, I'm very used to talking in schools. Very rarely in India get invited to talk at a university. So I'm very happy to be here. And seeing a lot of school students in the auditorium also makes me very happy. Because our universities in India are quite, um, let's say, um, you don't see many school students until they actually graduate and enter the university. So it's wonderful to see that here higher education and school education are perhaps uh, more connected. Um, what I'm going to do is maybe talk to you a little bit about uh, the uh, situation in India. The, the Wait, we got ahead of ourselves, yes. Uh, and then a little bit about where our work fits in. And uh, hopefully, um, I was told there will be a timekeeper who will tell me to stop talking at some stage, yes. Who is the timekeeper? So I should look at that person. Uh, and uh, we want to leave time for uh, questions um, that can happen. Uh, so please stop me, because I want to make sure that we have uh, time to talk to you. I begin by looking at what we as a country, India, has achieved in the last 20 or 25 years. You know, we are a very large country. We have a population of over a billion. And very large proportion of that is actually young people. Uh, and therefore, it's very important that we take education very seriously, because that is what builds the foundations of the future. So in the last 20 years, India has worked very hard to achieve close to universal enrollment. We have almost a school in every habitation in the country. So a village can have several habitations. And if the habitation is big enough, there is usually a school there. Currently, we have more than 96% of children of school going age going to school. And not only that, we find that every year more and more children not only go to school, but stay on in school. So if you look at the Indian population, and perhaps, what is the population of Hong Kong? Seven million. Seven million. Okay. So in India, the population for each age, so if I look at how many six-year-olds or seven-year-olds in India, for each age group, roughly 25 million. And so if you looked at our uh, figures 10 years ago, at how many children reached eighth grade, eight years of schooling. For us, elementary schooling is eight years. The number was about 12 million. And if I look at the number today, the number is close to 22 million. And this has happened in a short period of 10 years that almost everybody now, we have a compulsory education law. Almost everybody enters school and stays for at least eight years. And I think that this is a remarkable achievement for a country where, at least in the rural areas, if you look at the children who are in school today, at least half of their parents haven't had much formal education. So it's the first generation. And 2018 is a very significant year because our uh, compulsory education law was passed in 2010. So the first generation of children who were guaranteed eight years of schooling has happened this year. And so I think this is a very significant uh, point. Um, so if I look, and this is not just for India, but if I look around, many countries in this period have gone through this phase where they are able to almost bring everybody to school. There is still maybe a 5% left, but that 5% has a lot of different problems. It's often called the last mile problem. And those solutions perhaps have to be thought about for each context separately. But by and large, if you look at how has universal schooling been uh, achieved, uh, I think there were many things that went into it. But here are a few key pieces that I think are worth thinking about. And I break them up into, I think Professor Tam said, your university has four I's. And I think to bring about any big change in the world, you need to change four P's. <laughs> so the first one is, 
it was a problem. If children were not going to school, it was a problem that was well recognized. And one of the reasons, uh, well, one of the one of the key features of recognizing a problem is that it's visible. You can see children who are not in school. They are often on street corners. They are often in the village. You can see them. Uh, not going to school, and therefore it was a visible problem that was in front of everyone. If I look at policies over the years, both national and international policies have had a goal that we need to bring all our children to school. And perhaps more than policy, there's a perception that this is an important thing to do. Uh, between who are the actors who can help to bring uh, children to school? There's certainly the schools themselves, the government, but I think parents play a very big role as well. And in terms of going to school, I think very quickly a whole population understood what it means to go to school. You get up in the morning at a certain time, you get dressed, you go to a building, the building has rooms, every room has an adult. I mean, these are the key features of a school that even people who have not been to school could understand. And then I would say the practices that followed uh, you know, what are from the government side, what are the inputs that are necessary, what processes are necessary, how do you track and make sure everything is in fine, parents sending their children to school, and I think from the point of view of the education system, how to measure progress through the school system was all known. And overall, I would say there's an alignment from the goal to the actual process to the outcome that over a period of time across the world has ensured that we know how to send children to school. And so schooling for all has been, I would say, uh, a, you know, in terms of what we've been able to achieve in 25 years, a major accomplishment. And I want you to keep this in mind because where we are going now is to think about how do you not just have every child in school, but how do you have every child in school and learning well? And are there lessons from every child in school that it can be helpful for us in terms of thinking about learning for all. So now if I come to the story of my own organization, Pratham, we have always worked with two kinds of children. One is children who were left out. And in our early years, we did a lot of work with the children who were left out. Those were the ones who were not in school. And as I told you, that they were very visible. But as we continue to work with these uh, children and their families, we found and we got a sense in our early years we worked in Bombay, which is a, Mumbai, which is a very big city, uh, not as developed as Hong Kong, but similar, uh, small land, a lot of buildings and a lot of people uh, who, who uh, live there. We found that maybe children were in school, but parents and teachers would all say that things are not as good as they need to be. Children are coming to school now. But, uh, you know, more should be happening. And this was almost 20 years ago that you began to see this, that as more and more children came to school and you solved one problem, a whole set of other new problems sometimes come in front of you. Um, on our side, we were helping children in who were in school. We could see that many children were not at the level at which they need to be. And, you know, we worked hard with them. But... Around, I would say, 2000 or 2001, we too felt quite frustrated with what we were doing. And sometimes I find that frustration is a good thing because it forces you to think of other solutions. So look at it this way, that let's say I'm working with a child who's 10 years old, who has not got the basics of reading or math, uh, and I'm working hard with them. And in six months or eight months, the child learns how to read a few sentences. So that certainly is progress, but it's not sufficient. Because by that age, the child needs to be in fifth grade and being dealt with textbooks and curriculum, which is far higher than that. So we felt the need that we need to really do something much faster, much stronger, if we really want children to benefit from the schooling opportunities that are available. And so what we did at the time, we were already quite a big organization. We had about four or 500 full-time people, and we stopped what we were doing, and we started again. And we gave ourselves a month. Now, why a month? It's a good number um, to uh, keep in mind. Uh, two months would have perhaps even been better, but we started with a month, and we wanted to see what can you achieve in a month. 
So the first step, how many people can read this? One person, two people. So this is what a lot of parents feel like in India who are today sending their children to school, but they can't actually read. But even in this, I'm sure you can tell which is the easy one. Yes? Which one is the easiest thing to read on this? Which one? The letters, exactly. So even from the visual image, you can see what is easy and how it gets harder. And so I think the first job that our teams had was if I have a group of 25, 30, or 40 children, let me figure out first where every child is. And therefore, we developed this little tool and mainly to figure out where are children with whom we are working. Are all the children in my class all at a level where they can't read letters? Or are they spread out over these different few different stages? And then once we organized our class and understood who the children were and what level they were, you then start helping children to move from one level to the next. And so really, as we did this, we developed a method, our first initial stage of how do you get children to move from this first level to the last one, from the uh, reading letters to reading a small story, and in how much time and with what kinds of activities and resources. This was the beginning of, of this work. But as we did it, we noticed a couple of things. One was that there were different people in different parts of India trying to do this. So you needed a common vocabulary to, with which to talk. Because if you are striving for the same goal, you first need a goal. The goal for us was how do you get children to the reading the highest level, uh, which is just a simple story, fluently and with understanding. And you needed to be able to talk to each other so you could learn from each other about how you go from the first stage to, to the next. So it was clear to us that this, if this whole process is called assessment, then assessment is really the first step to what you need to do beyond this. And I think that it was important as we started thinking about the problem again, that you start with where the children are. You start with the reality of what is in front of you, because based on that reality, then you can build the path uh, that lies ahead. So exactly what, how did we proceed? We worked out a way in which we could actually teach children. And having worked that out, and I'll come to that later, the details of that later, in those early years from about 2001 or two in that period, this is essentially what we would do. You would go into a village, and each village or each community is different. So you need to understand the reality in that community. And so we would create what we call a village report card. A village report card which basically said, do you go to school? And if you can read, then where on that map of reading you are, and a similar one for arithmetic. And as you started doing this, a lot of people would help you. And I'm sure your villages perhaps are not so different from ours, but as soon as you're in the village doing something like this, everyone wants to know what you're doing. And once they ask you what you're doing, and if it's easy enough, then people want to participate and help. And so you would create this village report card with everybody's help. Then we would discuss the results to see this is the situation in this village. And then what we would offer is to say that as Pratham or as a Pratham team, we have a way of solving this problem. But do you have anybody in your village who would like to come forward? And very interestingly, this morning we met a lady. Uh, she's a grandmother. She came to uh, see us, me and my colleague Devyani who are here to say that she works in a school near her house and she finds that there are some children who are having uh, difficulty with this basic reading and she's helping them. So in a way, our volunteers were very similar as well. That is there a volunteer, is there somebody in the village who would like to help the children who are uh, uh, struggling? While we were doing this, we would demonstrate some activities. Because sometimes there is a big problem, but you don't know what to do. And even though you want to help, if it's not clear what to do, then you often don't want to engage. So it's important that there should be activities that you can see that are doable. So while this process of the village report card was going on, we would also on the side every day for an hour or so show people in the village how you could solve, play basically play, play simple math games, play simple language games to help uh, to show what can be done. And as the village would give you volunteers, we would train them. We would provide them with some support 
And these volunteers would then work with children for a period of two or three months. And then the results of how the children were doing were shared. Sometimes this happened in the school, if the school felt this was the right place to do it. Sometimes it happened after school. But it had to be done because the community wanted their children to progress. And I think that was an important part for us to learn, that when people come together, then big problems can be solved. It's hard to do it if you work on your own. And so village after village, I think at the time we worked in close to a thousand villages, we learned a number of different things. And I've tried to put this, what we learned in this uh, simple chart. First, we learned that you must really understand your problem. You must have a question. So the question with which we went into the village was to say, can children read? Can they do math? Can, do they go to school? And you have to be interested in the answer, otherwise you will not change the question. So, you know, very often we have big fat reports and they don't make any impact. And that's partly because nobody wanted the answers that are in the report. If you don't have a question, the answer doesn't help. So how do you engage people in being curious, in looking for questions, so that then the answers can follow? The second one is that if you want a, a big solution, you have to perhaps first create a platform, a platform on which people can participate. And if that process is very complicated, then people will walk away. They will say, let the experts solve the problem. If you want me as an ordinary person to solve the problem, then it should be easy enough for me to understand and to participate. And so I think that if this whole process of curiosity, of figuring out a systematic way of uh, looking at the problem uh, is all uh, uh, you know, an activity that is worth doing, in a way what we were doing, I realize now is, demystifying what research is. Because really, I think uh, what, what uh, people call research is a way of systematically understanding a problem and then using the appropriate methods to really solve it. The next question that we had to, the next, uh, I think, learning that we had is that very often, and at least it's in India, you have a lot of information, but you don't feel that information is connected to you. You know, India is a big country, it has big problems. You as a simple, ordinary person, how are you going to solve that problem? But if you have the data of your own village, of your own habitation, of your neighbors, in some way you are able to connect the individuals to the aggregate that you see. And it's very difficult to walk away from your own data. Because the data belongs to you, it belongs to your own community. And of course you have the choice to say, I don't want to do anything. But it's a lot harder when the problem is right in front of you in the face, there are some easy ways in which it could be solved, then it's very difficult to walk away. So I think that you know, enabling people to think about the problem and act based on what they see in front of them was important. The third key thing we learned is, uh, you know, we are very used to blaming other people. I don't know what uh, you all are like, but in my country, we, we, blame, we always blame other people. So when we were doing this village report card prob you know, activity in the village, you know, I was in enough villages to actually time how long it took to start the blaming thing. So the number I came up with is about 45 minutes. Uh, first you start with the British. Now the British left India 75 years ago. So first you blame them, that takes about five or 10 minutes. And generally the older people in the village blame the British. Then you blame the you know, national leaders. Then you blame the state leaders. Then you blame the principal of the school if he's not there. If he's there, you don't blame him. But if he's not there, you blame him. And so the, for the blame to come up to your level, it roughly, I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm not actually really joking. It's it, true. You have to let people vent what they feel. There's only one set of people that we in India don't blame. Can you guess who that is? Yourselves. Everybody else is to blame, but not you, because you always have some excuse for why you are the way. So we would let this whole thing come down, and then we'd say, fine, as an ordinary person of this community, you have a choice. The choice is you can do something, or you can do nothing. In India, we have 600,000 villages. So if your village doesn't want to do anything, we'll just walk to the next village. As soon as you say that, people say, no, 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 wait, wait, wait. We will find uh, some people who can help to solve this situation. So it was important for us to say, what are you going to do? Before we ask somebody else to solve the problem, is there anybody in this community who wants to come forward to solve your own problem? Once you do that, then you can turn to the school or to the government or to whoever and say, I'm doing this. 
What will you do? So really, this whole process taught us uh, these four things. That first, you must engage. You must understand really what the problem is. You have to think about what you will do. And only then, you go and ask other people what to do. And this process led us and many communities to start solving this learning problem uh, in, a, in, a, in, a, in a serious way. Um, I want to take just five minutes to tell you one short story which uh, I think illustrates this. So I was in a village in one of our most uh, backward uh, states, which is called UP, Uttar Pradesh. And it is customary when we were doing all of this to go and talk to the village headman to say, I'm in your village and I'm going to do this. And in that case, in that particular situation, the village headman was a, uh, he had a business with uh, uh, cows and buffaloes selling milk. So he was a very busy guy. When I went to him, he didn't even look up. He said, what are you doing? What do you want to do? And I explained and he said, oh, you're doing a survey. Go ahead. Lots of people come and do surveys. A couple of days later, we came back with the results of the survey. And he was still very busy because, you know, people are very busy people. They have businesses to run. And he said, oh, you're done. Where should I sign? Now, on our village report card, there is nowhere to have a signature. Because it doesn't, you don't need a signature. Everybody was there when it was done. And so I said, there is no, uh, that there is no signature. So he looked up at me and he clearly thought I was, you know, not doing the right thing. And he said, uh, please ask your boss. Because usually in India, we collect information to send it up. It's the only thing in the world that defies gravity. Data goes up, okay? <laughs> so, you know, I like to think of myself as not having too much of an ego. But I must say that when he said to ask your boss, I was a bit upset. And I said, I'm the boss. <laughs> he was not impressed by that. He said, if you're the boss, why are you running around in villages? And you don't even have a car. And so how can you be the boss if you don't have all these boss-like things? But all of this got his attention. And then he said, OK, tell me exactly what you're doing. So we explained, this is what we are doing. We are creating a, a full census of the village. Are children in school? Can they read? Can they do math? He said, you know, I'm the head man of this village. I'm the head of the village council. I know my village. And I can tell you that almost all children are in school, excepting one, two, three. This one has this problem. This one's father ran away. This one, something. And his assessment of the children who are not in school was exactly right. And then I said, correct. You are right. We are right. But here we have 100 children in this village, let's say, and only 45 can read. So he said... Um, that's untrue. There's a difference, okay? It's untrue, it's false. What does that mean? It means you're lying. So, you know, there was a whole village. In India, you can never be by yourself. All your billion neighbors are right with you. And so everybody else who had helped in this process said, no, no, this is true because we have actually done this. The village headman said, you know, it's a big village. Most people, when they come to do a survey, they do two or three households, and they get tired, they get thirsty, they go to the tea shop, they drink tea, and then they fill out the rest of the survey forms, <laughs> and they go home because it's a very hard job. And so it's perfectly understandable because there's some boss sitting somewhere has sent somebody to the village with a very hard job. Now, all my supporters in the village said, no, but this one has actually been done by us and we have helped. So the village headman moved his position from saying this is a lie or this is false to it can't be. It can't be is it's, it can't be. Because how can it be that the children who are going to school can't read? Because the reason we send children to school is that they will get an education. Now, I'm telling you this whole story partly because it took that much to change this. We had a report card. The report card said what it said. But if you don't believe what's in it, then you're not going to act. And so it took all of this to get this man to be really curious about what really is the situation in my village. And he said, OK, there's one way for me to figure it out. I'm going to go and ask the children to read. So he walked down the uh, village path, and whichever poor child he met on the way, he asked them to read. And you see my reading uh, test. And by the fifth or sixth child, he said, oh my god, we really have a problem. And so it was very important, I think, that the problem should become visible, believable, and connected to you before you stop milking your cows and say, I have to do this. I have to deal with this problem. And I think we learned all of this by doing all of these things in the village. So I want to switch from this village kind of circle of how do you understand the problem and how do you lead to action 
to the fact that if you want a whole country to feel like this, then what should you do? It's not enough. And now you cannot meet every headman one by one and bring about this change. I mean, you know, we are a big country and we have to do this quickly. And so we moved from these village report cards to thinking, can you create district, state, and maybe a country report card? And that whole exercise, we started in 2005. And in many ways, I think, uh, you know, in the video that we were seeing before, one of my colleagues said, the word impossible does not exist in our vocabulary. But I think we also don't think very hard because when we thought we should do the whole country, we didn't think what it really means. You know, it's a big country. We have 600 plus districts. You have to find if you want to do this very systematically. It has, anyway. Uh, but we started doing this in 2005 and we were very surprised that as you went from district to district, you actually found people who were willing to go to 20 or 30 representative villages and actually do this exercise. And in the village, we didn't do every kid because we were trying to create a district report card. But you at least did all the children in your sampled households. And this, uh, this big survey, which is called ASAR, you were quite right, the, the, the pronunciation is, is fine, uh, means in English it stands for Annual Status of Education Report. But in many Indian languages, it means impact. And therefore, this whole exercise we wanted should have some impact. And we didn't realize the significance of the letter A. A stood for annual, which meant that you have to do it every year. And so, whatever, 16 years later, we are still doing it. And what the report card has done, I would say, is that it has done many things. One thing is that I think it has really shaken up our whole country. In the beginning, people were like my headman. They would say this is a lie. Then they would say it's not true. And then eventually now they say, no, no, this is a real problem. And we also found that this whole exercise, as it got well known, people came from other countries to take a look at it. And really, they have taken away what made sense to them. So I think uh, she said that it's gone to many countries. Actually, people have come and taken it to their own country. We have not gone to other countries to uh, give it to them. And uh, this is the way that I think that we tried to create a whole national environment to think about the problem that we were seeing in village after village or community after community about children are going to school, but they are not learning. And what can we do to at least build their basic uh, uh, learning? I want to take you to, the, uh, to the, what the, this huge report actually does. If you had to boil the report down and only discuss one page, this would be the page that we would discuss. And so you can see that the, the reading task that you saw is here in uh, columns. There is kids who cannot even read letters all the way to who can read a, uh, the highest level, which is a grade level uh, two text. If you look at it, if you look at the fifth grade, you can see that uh, you know in each 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 row is like a uh, is a is a school is a class, and like many other school systems in the world, our Indian school system is also organized by age and grade. So if you are uh, ten years old in India, you should be in fifth grade. If you are eight years old, you should be in third grade. And we have our system created such that for different age and grade, you put them in a different in a class. There is a certain set of expectations about what you will learn in that class, and that's how whole education system is organized. So look at fifth grade, and we see, and this is the latest, this 2016 results. We see, if you look at the last cell there, you see that almost 50% of children are actually able to read the highest level, which is a second grade level. What about the rest? The rest are spread out over different categories. If I take the beginner and the letter level together, it's almost 19, maybe say 20% of kids who are in fifth grade, five years of school, but still struggling with reading anything more than letters. Similarly, we have about almost 15% who can read words, but they can't read anything more. Now, if you have children in fifth grade like that, and you're a fifth grade teacher, and you're part of a system which says in fifth grade, you pick up the fifth grade textbook and you start in the beginning of the textbook and go to the end, guess who will benefit from this? The children who are in my 50%. And all these others will not benefit. And slowly who put up their hand and say they need to go to the bathroom 20 times because you're not connected to what is happening in the class. 
And so increasingly, our system takes the children who are in the front of the class and puts them in the front of the next class and the next class, and I think the back of the class just empties out. And that is how our education system you know, proceeds. And so we can't blame the fifth grade teacher because she has a job. She has to teach fifth grade. And nobody has trained her for what she should do with all of this rest. And you know, I, was, I used to say that this is a long tail of the distribution. And I was talking in some big crowd like this, and somebody put their hand up and said, this is the body of the distribution. You know, there's, it's not a tail. A tail seems to be a long, thin thing. This is not long and thin. It's a big, fat thing. So the body of that whole distribution is not getting the attention. And therefore, this is the situation that we are in. And so, in all of this, these are numbers. But if you think of the human face of this, what does it mean? I would say this means that the teacher who is working hard and doesn't feel that the people at the back of the class are benefiting gets quite discouraged. If you work hard and you don't see any benefit to that, you get discouraged. Uh, children get disinterested because whatever is going on is of no use to them and so they leave. And parents who often have not been to much school themselves get disappointed because they thought that by going to the school and doing all of this, everybody was going to be in a better place. So disappointed, discouraged, disinterested leads everyone into a negative place. And therefore, you know, in case you have to win the positive energy prize, <laughs> you have to do something to get out of this negative place, out of this big stuck, and be able to really energize the system to get out. And we feel that in most places where you see this kind of cycle, you really need a, something that just helps you burst out of this and change, given the same set of resources, change where you are at. So this is, I think, what we've been trying to do for the last 10 or 15 years. Now, you know, we have a lot of intellectuals in India, and they will say, now, let's first analyze why this is it. And I think there could be many reasons for why this, this is. I've put a few of them here. But for us, the two important things are that you have parents at home who understand schooling but don't understand how to help you learn because they themselves have not had much education. And you have a school system which teaches by grade and therefore the school system is not flexible enough to stop and help the kids when they need the help. And, uh, you know, there could be many other reasons, poverty, malnutrition, you know, all kinds of things. But these are the two things, the parents and the school system that we focus on. And here's what we do, just to give you a quick snapshot of what are the key elements and why does it help. At some level, if I go back to this chart, the simple thing that we do, and I would say that is our contribution to trying to help the problem, is to say that, just for a little while, it could be a few hours a day or it could be a few months in the year, move away from teaching by rows and move into teaching by columns. And if I look at these grade three, four, and five, at least in India, many of them are not very different by age. So it's not like I'm putting the very small children with the very old children. And so the typical thing that we do is we assess the children and then instead of having one teacher teach third grade or fourth grade or fifth grade, but there's a big variation in who the children are. For two hours a day, I will teach all the children who can't read letters how to read letters. Children who can't read words. So it's a very simple thing. Same situation. I just move from working by rows into working by columns. And I would say that that's really uh, uh, teaching at the level of the child is what we are doing. So our key elements are you take your assessment, find out where the children are. You do it one by one. So everybody can, every teacher can hear the child trying to read. So it's not just the data, you also hear where they're getting stuck. Uh, then you group them by their level rather than by their grade. And these children's groups, the children help each other also in their groups. You take the teachers who are available and you uh, put them by the groups. And then every group gets a set of activities that they can do, which help them to move to the next level. And periodically, go back to the assessment and see if you've made progress. There is nothing more, uh, what shall I say, energizing than feeling that you have helped a bunch of children move. I think almost everybody 
uh, can remember, perhaps at least the parents or the older uh, adults in the room can remember when their children learn to read. It's a critical point. It's like learning to swim, learning to ride a bike. It's like that. Once you cross that threshold, you never go back. And I think that this positive energy that comes out of this is really taking people over that threshold. And if you look at videos, and I'm going to show you some later, when a child can't read and you ask them to read, they do lots of things. One is they don't look at you in the eye. They look down, they look up, they rub their nose, they have something else to do. And you know, you, they can't engage with you because they know they're not able to do something. Once a child, child learns to read, back becomes straighter, they look you in the eye, the voice becomes stronger. So this is not just about reading, it's about a lot of other things that give you the confidence in your own capability for learning some more or taking the next step. And so this way is the way that we take to break out of the big stuck and bring the energy back into the system with the same set of people, same teachers, same children, but just reorganized in a different way for them to feel that we can do it. Teachers to feel like I helped my child to move ahead, the child to feel that I'm worth it, and the parents to feel that this whole schooling business actually means something. So I would say that this is the core of the story that we do. Now I'll move quite quickly because I want to leave some time for you. We work in two ways. One is we work directly, and the other is we work with the government. When we work directly, there is a Pratham person who demonstrates how this can be done. And we've been doing it over 10, 12 years. So now we are, we are, now we are uh, you know, quite good at actually showing you. And this whole change that you see, today anybody in Pratham, and we have about 6,000 full-time people, can, with any group of children, almost in a guaranteed way, can do it in 30 or 40 days, working about two to three hours a day. So I would say 100 hours is all that a child needs at this age to be turned around and to really be at least with the basic foundational skills. The second way is that this is not enough for us to do it on our own. We need to place it within the very large school system that we have and energize the school system to be able to follow some of these things. And I want to show you what it looks like. So this is, let's say, when Pratham is working on its own, this is what it looks like. The two green slabs are when their kids are able to read a paragraph or a story. And the red and the orange are when you're not even able to read words. Okay, And this is a 30 to 40 day. And this is our uh, data from last year. So it's you know almost 150,000 children that we are talking about. And this is what it looks like every 10 days. So this is for us a big sign that the world can be a different place if you just focus on the problem, use the resources in a different way, and come up with uh, 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 really, I mean, I think when I heard that we were giving the prize in positive energy, I hadn't thought about it that way. But this is really bringing a big uh, push of positive energy into the whole system so that the same system can really produce far better results. Now, you may say that this is what Pratham is doing, because you people are, you know, somehow you've got the ability to do it. Uh, what about when the government does it? Do you see similar changes? And here is what I wanted to show you was this is one of the states, uh, but this is one of the states in which we are working nowadays. The blue is the, uh, the, the percentage of children who could read when we started, when the, when the program started with the government. And the green is uh, where they got to by the end of three months. And you can see even with the government system, with the government school teachers, in the same state, there were many different districts which started at different points. But everywhere you see that that green chunk is almost, uh, you know, is significant. That you're able to bring about change across this state using just the resources that the state government has. So whether we work directly or with the governments, we see that this big change is possible. It's been evaluated by, uh, you know, very uh, world-renowned researchers. And so these are not just numbers. These have also been verified. So I've already gotten my five-minute warning. Now they're going to show me a three-minute warning. Or is it two minutes? So I'm going to wind up. Um, so if I want to take, go back to how did we achieve schooling for all, and what are the challenges that we have to now have learning for all, I think you can, you can probably, you could, you could have filled out this chart as well. So schooling got solved because the problem was visible. 
in learning, we can see that often that learning problem is invisible because children are already in school. And therefore, we need to see it. And it's a little bit harder to see. So the kinds of efforts that we've done are efforts to bring the problem out so that you can feel it, you can understand it, you can see it. Policy, if you think of the Millennium Development Goals or you think of national goals, they had a very clear goal that you need to get all children in school. Today, if I look at the Sustainable Development Goals, they do talk about learning, but there's 4.1.1, 4.1.2, 4. You know, it's very hard to be motivated by 0 0.1, 0 0.2, 0 0.3. We need to say learning for all. And then, just like we said, universal schooling, you need to have universal learning. Inputs and processes for how you get from having very few children in school to everyone in school is kind of known now. And I think uh, for learning, we are moving in that direction. I have shown you one model. There could be other models. But they, are, they need to be widely accepted to say this thing can change. And this is the way to do it. And so on and so forth. So I think that you, you, know, you have to think, how are people looking at the problem? What is the policy that is going to help us reach the goal? How do common people understand what the problem is? And what are the practices that need to be aligned to make this happen? We have good examples of achieving schooling for all. And I think we need to take some inspiration from that to say we've made a big change in the world. We can now make the big change in the next set of important things, which is learning for all. So now I have my one minute time will come up. So I have to summarize because a good assignment, you should summarize at the end. I've been taught that in uh, school and in college. Um, so, the assumption that schooling is simply equal to learning is clearly not correct. We need to focus both on schooling and on learning, and they need different efforts, right? Uh, today, currently, in many of our school systems, teaching is at the grade level. This leads to teaching to the top of the class, which leaves the majority behind. Many things need to happen in an education system, but they can't happen unless you have your foundational skills in place. And among the foundational skills are, I think, reading, being able to express yourself, and very basic math. If you do those, you create some self-reliance in the kids, and they can move ahead. And if you can build strong foundations in early grades and help those who have somehow been left behind to catch up, I think you're doing a big job in strengthening the core of the education system. Overall, if you have complicated things, nobody's going to come with you. If you have straightforward things, it's easy to mobilize to get people to help. And finally, we think it's really important that families have to come along. Every single person in this room would not be here if they didn't have a supportive family that supported their education and wanted them to do better. Uh, and and uh, you know, these are, I think, the key learnings uh, that we've had. That's it. Thank <laughs> you.